board and I'm gonna click present. Okay, um, can everyone see United States history? Okay, so just a quick introduction. My name is Steffi Chen. Um, I wanna be your tutor for United States history. Um, and today we'll be focusing on period uh, one and we're gonna briefly going over uh, period two. Um, so Wait, that, that one says you're focusing on period two and briefly going over period one. Yes, I say the opposites are. We we're, were going over period one and I sent y'all a reading um, for period um, uh, period one um, this past week. So we're gonna be going over it a little bit, like a little summary, and then we're just going straight to period two. Um, some of the things about me, I also teach the visual arts class for alphabetic learning. So if you're interested in art, you can always apply for that as well. Um, so we're gonna go straight to it. Okay. This is much harder than that. Okay. I guess it doesn't work. I'll just go to straight here. So period one. Yeah, I don't think it works when I'm presenting. Okay. So um, we learned about the new world or as the reading I sent you, it's, it was about the new world and um, basically the first Americans. So we split the era um, in America into four different parts. We have the Pacific Northwest, which we mentioned how there was an abundant number of resources, which means that there was a lot of rivers and a lot of forests. They mainly plant, uh, they mainly, they mainly um, uh, fished salmon, which was in great abundance during this time. So that was a big part of their uh, nutritious, I guess, feeding. Um, next is the desert Southwest, which is um, in this area. So obviously it's a desert, so it's has, it had a drier climate than the Northwest coast right here. Um, the Native Americans that did live here were the Pueblo. They lived near Rio Grande. And um, the Hopi made multiple stories out of adobe, which is this kind of um, material used for brick bricks. It looks like bricks. Um, it looks made for houses. And they mainly planted a lot of maize, which I mentioned, which was corn beans, melons, and squash. Um, and then here's the Great Plains. What characterized the Great Plains um, from the other areas, it's, it's mainly flat land. It's flat grassland, so there's not that many trees. And the Great Plains, there were a lot of buffalo herds that um, roamed around, and many um, Native Americans here still, uh, they planted corn, bean, and squash. Um, what the Great Plains known for also is the Pawnee tribe, and the Pawnee tribe um, used buffalo skin and bluff, um, and used like remains from buffalo to build their houses of teepee, and that's like where the word come from, teepees. And lastly, we have the Eastern Woodlands, which is right here, um, and it's characterized by very hardwood forests, which meant that there were a lot of coniferous trees, and the tribe that did live, that did live here were the Creek, Chattawa and Powhatan. Um, and that's like the first kind of Americans we do see. We then also mentioned the Columbia Exchange, which is the exchange of plants, animals, and germs between a new world and Europe after the discovery of America. So if you look at the picture here, I wish I could like present it. I don't think it, it didn't work. Oh, it works, okay. Um, you, you see here, there was an exchange of tobacco, sweet potato, um, we mentioned before corn, beans, and squash to Europe, but from Europe to America, there was different, um, I guess, livestock and plants as well. There were a lot of diseases, um, including smallpox, influenza, malaria, typhus, measles, um, and all these diseases would be very detrimental to the Native American population as they were not exposed to diseases before. So the Columbia Exchange, while it did bring an exchange of like good materials and good resources, they led to the depletion of the Native American community in North America. And then we also talked about the encomienda system. Um, so we spoke about how Spain was actually one of the first European colony, um, countries to actually colonize North America. And they created this 
and, com and commienda system, which granted a license, uh, which granted the Spanish crown to give licenses to royal officials. Basically, what it did is it gave um, it gave these royal officials the ability to use Native Americans as labor in specific areas, especially since you know much of the um, economy in much of the like economic resources that Spain found were from mining silver and gold and also uh, planting these, you know, um, really, uh, uh, really good crops that were in high demand back in Europe. So it began in the Caribbean and then spread to Mexico. And this is a very, you know, brutal picture of a depiction of the encomienda system. And we also talked about the Pueblo Revolt in which one, um, many of the causes of the Pueblo Revolt was because, you know, the Spanish began to gradually gain control over the land and um, of the Pueblo people living in New Mexico um, because they, you know, uh, they put forth their encomienda systems and then they try to convert many of these um, Americans to worship Catholic, Roman Catholic faith. And they, they were really angry, um, specifically Pope. Um, he technically Pueblo, um, he led this revolt because he felt that, you know, he felt his hatred for, um, the Spanish people, they were trying to convert his people and they're trying to like put these people in through the encomienda system was really bad. Um, so the, so he led a revolt, but then following 1688, which was his death, um, the Spanish people launched a reconquest of uh, the Pueblo land. And when the Spanish did return, they adopted greater cultural accommodation. So, um, over the next century from 16, uh, six, late 1600s all the way to early 1700s, there was this kind of blend of Spanish and Pueblan culture. All right, does anyone have any questions about period one? No? Okay, we're gonna go on period two right away. Period two. So what we're gonna uh, learn about in period two is uh, mainly the um, English colonies. So we talked about in the gold. Oh, yeah. We talked about the we talked about the Spanish colonies, right? Um, or the Spanish establishment of colonies. So it's going to be about English North America. So first things first. Why would England want to, I guess, um, settle or make settlement in North America? There uh, were no numerous number of reasons. Um, Many of the reasons include um, the fact that the Britain population was rapidly increasing. And there was this new co policy called enclosure, which meant that you know, for farming, you had to fence your um, land out, which meant that there was less or there was no land for the poor because the wealthy would only you know, utilize much of this fencing. And um, the woolen districts also fell, which meant that workers lost many of their jobs. So we have three really important um, factors as to why, um, you know, as to why uh, they wanted to move outside. And lastly, we have primogeniture. Does anyone know what primogeniture means? Okay. Um, I guess, I guess I can explain it. So primogeniture was basically this kind of, um, I wouldn't say policy, but it was basically this kind of like, I would say tradition maybe, that um, when you had, um, you know, your business and your numerous number of numerous fields of land, you would always give it to your first born um, male or like your first son, right? So which meant that, you know, your second sons, your third sons, and all your um, secondary children would not be able to receive like land or like part of your business. So it meant that, you know, many of these second sons, third sons, they um, looked upon America as a way, you know, to gain some kind of profit or to gain, gain a name for themselves or any kind of like economic prosperity. Those are the four reasons why mainly um, they wanted to settle in America. In, um, in 1600, North American land was also mostly unclaimed by Spanish. So that was another reason. And by uh, 1606 and 1600s, the joint stock company was perfected. Basically, the joint, company, joint stock company basically is investors putting in money into the company, hoping for a greater return. So the Virginia Joint Stock Company received a charter from James um, I to make settlement, and the settlement was called Jamestown. And 
um, many of you do know that um, Jamestown would be the first kind of like permanent um, colony established. Um, if you look at the hair, it was like supposed to be like a plan. So um, many of the characteristics that lied within Jamestown was one, the scarcity of women. Um, because there were fewer, because there were a few women, and a lot of men died due to malnutrition, disease, or famine, or conflict with Native Americans. Um, the the status of women were the status of women, um, the socioeconomic status of women were pretty much strengthened. Um, they also had their first kind of representative, representative legislative assembly called the Virginia House of Burgesses, and as I spoke again, there was a lot of you know famine, disease, and conflict, and Jamestown Colony was almost on the brink of collapse. Oops. Okay, next is the Chesapeake Colonies. So we're gonna, if you look at the picture, we're gonna split the original 13 colonies into four categories. We're gonna split it into the New England Colonies, Middle Colonies, Chesapeake Colonies, and the Southern Colonies. So the Chesapeake Colonies include Maryland and Virginia. So we just talked about Virginia, the settling down of Jamestown in Virginia. Um, so then um, Maryland, um, Maryland was founded by Lord Baltimore for the Roman Catholics. So if you don't know during this time or before the English settlement, there was this new, I guess, Church of England. Um, There's a new Church of England uh, founded by King Henry. And basically it brought a new kind of like, um, I guess Protestant sector um, to what was once the Roman Catholic Church. Um, so in 1649, he made the toleration, um, which was intended to protect the um, minority rights of many Catholics from many Protestants um, that were part of the Church of England. Um, Chesapeake Colony. They grew a lot of tobacco, and there was this head right system that benefited a lot of wealthy landowners. Um, which basically, uh, head right system was basically a system of land where, um, you know, many landowners just uh, increased their um, increase their amount of land. But um, of course, the poor um, poor were uh, only amounted to like farming or um, working for these wealthy landowners. Um, there was also the system of indentured servitude. Does anyone know what indentured servitude is? You can type it in the chat as well. I know. Um, Evelyn, do you want to explain what indentured servitude is? Well, so these people, they wanted to go to the colonies, but they didn't have enough money to pay for the ride. So in exchange for the ride, they would work for a few years, and then they would they could either continue on working for pay or go somewhere else. Yep, that is, yep, that is absolutely correct. 1607, 1676, exactly what Evelyn described as this period of indentured servitude. Um, and then what dramatically changed this period was during 1676 to 1677 called Bacon's Rebellion. Basically, um, these, um, uh, these, I guess, people, uh, these Virginian settlers um, who were once indentured servants and who were and there were indentured servants involved with this rebellion led by Nathan Bacon they led a revolt against Governor William Berkeley um, in Virginia and main, mainly the reason why Bacon started this kind of rebellion was one he was left out of Berkeley's inner circle and two Berkeley refused to allow Bacon to take part in any fur trading with Native Americans and we refused Bacon a military commission that allowed him to fight and attack Native Americans. So many of these former indentured servants, they really wanted land for themselves and they wanted to move out of like the already, the um, already colonized lands to, I guess, have to Native American land, but obviously that was off limits set by Governor William Berkeley. Um, and, you know, uh, Bacon really didn't like that. So he started a rebellion um, joined by many past indentured servants and indentured servants. So uh, we're also gonna be talking about the effects of what caused slavery. Um, there, were many, there were many factors. I split them up into four. 
um, the geographic factors that caused slavery was one, obviously the fertile land, the warm climate, and the rainfall. There was also a lot of rivers in um, North America. So all these factors contributed to the increasing demand to grow agriculture. Um, then we're gonna move on to the economic demands, economic factors. Um, one, it was the fact that tobacco was prosperous and there was high demand in England. So there was obviously, they want, in order to grow more tobacco, there was need for more inexpensive labor. Social reasons. So um, much of the colonies that were um, down south, uh, there was, it was dominated by a small, powerful, wealthy planter society. Um, and many impoverished whites felt superior to slaves. So um, it was kind of this uh, system where they wanted slavery because um, they, although they were still poor, they still wanted like this um, higher rank than um, other people. And the fact that resistance was futile. Um, although there were some resistances in the um, 1739 called the Stone Rebellion, but that just led to more stricter laws, stricter codes that prevented slaves or prevented Amer Africans from um, from reading, from uh, from marriage, and just from a lot of like the basic rights. And lastly, it was Bacon's Rebellion because Bacon's Rebellion proved that indentured servitude wasn't that um, it wasn't that good. It wasn't that reliable since they might cause an uprising. Um, and then we're going to be talking about the New England colonies. Um, so New England colonies include Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. But we're only going to be talking about Rhode Island, Connecticut, and uh, Massachusetts. So the Puritans. Um, so the Puritans settled in Massachusetts Bay, so around this area. And you might be asking, who are the Puritans? Because they often get um, confused with the pilgrims. So the Puritans were Protestants who wanted to reform the Church of England. They didn't like how religious leaders, you know, had so much control in the Church of England and they had so many um, elaborate rituals. So they escaped England due to religious persecution. Um, does anyone know what religious persecution is? No. Um, yeah, for sure. So religious persecution was basically, you know, um, many of the Puritans or many of the people in England, the Protestants, didn't really like the Puritans. So they would hunt them down and they would inflict all sorts of violence against them. Dana, you have your hand raised. Dana? Um, I wanted to answer the question. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, do you want to add on to the religious persecution part? Yep. Okay, I'm going to lower your hands first. So they settled in Massachusetts Bay and they wanted to build a colony based on biblical law and teachings and basically set an example for the world. Um, the Puritans was also, um, many say they were also the cause of the Great Migration in Europe. Um, basically lasting from 1629, 1640, where 15,000 um, people from England traveled to um, Massachusetts, traveled to uh, the American colonies. So I know that um, a lot of people really confuse the Pilgrims and the Puritans. So here's like this kind of T chart you can find. The Pilgrims, you might know from their first Thanksgiving. Um, so they were actually a group of English people that traveled to America in 1620 on the Mayflower. Y'all might know about the Mayflower Compact. Um, and they settled in Plymouth, Massachusetts. So they settled in this area. Um, they were actually separationists, which meant that they, could, they found that the Church of England could not be reformed and they wanted to set up their own church. And they had a government similar to democracy where you know, there were a lot of elected officials, um, they had a representative government. Um, the Puritans was different. They traveled 10 years after the pilgrims. They were not separationists, which meant that they thought that the Church of England could be reformed, but not in that present time. So they brought it to America and they had a government very similar um, to theocracy, which does anyone know what theocracy is? No. Yeah, um, 
so theocracy was this government that was, um, I guess, controlled by the idea that God gave you um, certain, um, God gave you certain powers. So like um, elected officials um, felt that, you know, oh, God um, chose me to be an elected official. So unlike democracy, where it's just, just by um, people voting, um, theocracy, many Puritans also felt that, you know, some of the elected officials were also like ministers and they were also connected to the church somehow. Um, so they were also known for their strict and flexible interpretation of the Bible and religion. And we're gonna learn more about that. So Puritan society, um, many migrated in family groups. So this is different from what we learned in Chesapeake um, community because um, Chesapeake, there was a lot of single men, single wealthy, I guess, men that were coming from England. But Puritan society, many migrated in family groups and they lived in compact villages with community meeting houses. So again, we see this idea of self-government forming in um, the original colonies. And it was a very patriarchal society, which meant that the male was um, the lead of the household. They valued education, so residents can actually read and understand the Bible. Um, the most uh, famous person, I guess, of Puritan society is John Winthrop. He was the first governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony. And he often also did um, some, um, I guess, he would also uh, do some like, they're almost sermons where he like spoke to large crowds. Um, and then we also have here the last one, the stockholders um, who, invested, who invested in Massachusetts Bay Colony could only vote. And they were usually male, so. And we have, um, the Puritans are also known for the Salem witch trials. Um, does anyone know what the Salem witch trials were? Or, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, like little girls. Like, yeah. So they up. say they saw witches and stuff. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, so it started with a few young girls, and they they started acting strangely, and they um, accused people people um of uh cursing them and the th first three to be accused were a uh, slave to future well i don't know how to pronounce her name and then sarah osborne and sarah sarah good and sarah osborne died in prison and the slave confessed to witchcraft and she spent a long time in prison before being sold to a new yeah. owner and then Sarah Good went on trial and was found guilty. Yep. And the first and there's a lot more facts. Yep, for sure. Um Sean, you wanted to say something? Um, some facts are, um, I mean, I got caught by rock. Um, there was a four-year-old, I think, that was also held in custody. Um, many people were hanged. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, many people were hanged, yeah. Um, yeah, so what everyone said is correct. I guess from now on, when you want to participate, you can just click on your um, raised hand so I can, like, call on everyone so it's not, um, you know, chaotic. But yeah, what y'all said were correct. Um, so actually over 200 people were accused of witchcraft in 20... So, yep, yep, Evelyn. I have something to say. Basically, witchcraft is just, they think they make a deal with the devil, which is the opposite of God. And mm -hmm. by doing that, they, they the devil gives them powers. Right, yeah. So um, there are many reasons as to why, you know, um, these girls, a lot of people think that these girls or these um, young women accused people of witchcraft. Some said it was because they were bored. Some say that it was mass hysteria, which meant that, you know, when one person does it, everyone else thinks that, oh my gosh, I'm feeling that, like, everyone else thinks that, you know, they feel the same kind of, like, feeling when they accuse someone, so it started, like, growing. Um, other people have said there was this ergot poisoning. So ergot was this kind of this plant near this area. And many people said that they were poisoned, which caused delusions or um, just which led to the hysteria. Um, now we're gonna go on the establishment of Connecticut. In uh, May of 1636, Thomas Hooker led 100 out of Massachusetts Bay because he believed that the governor and officials in um, Puritan in the Puritan society had too much power and he wanted to develop a colony with strict limits on government and he gave all men 
all men who had the land, the ability to vote. And that's a picture of Thomas. Rhode Island, it was kind of established the same way. Roger Williams, he advocated for the separation of church and state, freedom of thought, religious toleration, but he was banished from Massachusetts Bay because many of um, you know, the leaders in, Puritan, in the original Puritan society felt that um, these, uh, these ideas that he was like, you know, speaking out about didn't make sense to them and they didn't like him like spreading these ideas to like people of, this, um, of the community. So um, in, his, in Rhode Island, all white men could vote. So we see this difference from, you know, men, white men who can own land to just all white men could vote. And his colony was also known for freedom of religion and religious toleration. And then we're going to go to the mid-Atlantic colonies. So the mid-Atlantic colonies, um, as we saw before, it was Pennsylvania, there was New York, um, and it was um, all the colonies that were in the middle between Chesapeake and between the um, North uh, England colonies. Um, so the geographic, geographic characteristics, they included moderate winters, fertile soil, <coughs> harbors, longer growing seasons than the New England mm -hmm. colonies. Um, the most I guess, famous port would be, uh, famous would be Pennsylvania, where, um, William, where William Penn founded Pennsylvania as a whole experiment for a refuge for Quakers. Um, it was a very liberal colony, um, as in, you know, they had a representative assembly and they were pacifists, which meant that they rather um, they condemned violence so there was more peace over violence and they opposed slavery so they were kind of the first abolitionists. The southern colonies we have um, two main ones um, although Virginia would be considered a southern colony but this would just be the original 13. We have Cal Carolina which was founded in 1663 but separated in 1712. It had a humid climate and since it was very humid and there was a lot of swampy coastal land, it was very prone to diseases called malaria, um, which, you know, uh, which was caused by mosquitoes. Um, and most of the uh, crops that were grown in Carolina were actually indigo and rice. Um, Georgia, which actually la lasted the original 13 colonies found, founded in 1738. James Oglethorpe wanted to give prisoners a second chance, but much of these prisoners were actually debt, um, people who owned people who owned debt in um, Great Britain. So just wanted to give them a second chance. And King George II also wanted Georgia as a buffer between South Carolina and the Spanish troops in Florida. So a buffer state is basically a state that um, it's between these two, uh, between these two, what, what Georgia was, is, was between these two um, colonies and he just wanted, you know, Georgia there before like any conflicts occurred between Spanish and um, the English groups. And James also outlawed slavery in Georgia. So um, if you see here is a picture of North Carolina and South Carolina. They split um, mainly because it was easier to control um, over, this big area of land. And we also have the West Indies near the Caribbean where they mainly planted sugar and there was this mass use of uh, mass, I guess, implantation of slavery. Um, just a lot of um, Africans were uh, transported from Africa to work to get sugar cane, to work on sugar cane plantations. So under all the under um, all the colonies followed this idea of idea of mercantilism. So um, right now we in the United States we have something called capitalism. That's how our economy works. But back then, um, Great Britain, many European countries believed in mercantilism. And you look at this three, I guess three way kind of like this image. Um, basically, uh, it's a really good explanation of what mercantilism was. European countries thought that wealth was finite and they thought that the more wealthy you are, the more power you had. And um, because wealth was finite, it meant that if one state gained something, another one lost. So it's that is why- finite. Hmm? It's pronounced finite. Oh, sorry. Thanks, thanks for correcting me. Um, I don't know your name because you don't have- 
Um, so yeah, so that, that caused um, the Navigation Acts, um, which was these acts that um, said that no ship um, could trade in the colonies unless it was constructed in England or in the colonies itself. So it prevented um, the colonies to trade with, um, I guess, French um, and other uh, European countries. Um, and, but then um, while you did have the Navigation Acts, Britain also um, went by this, I guess, ideal or this action of solitary neglect where um, many New England, actually many New England colonies and many colonial merchants were actually able to evade such burdensome regulations um, because it wasn't really heavily enforced. So uh, the colonies had some form of economic independence. Um, so we're also gonna be talking about the first great awakening, which happens um, within uh, the colonies. And the first great awakening was this wage of wave of religious revivals that began in New England in 1730, but swept the colonies in 1740. So um, I guess the main debate in, for, in the First Great Awakening was the idea between, white ideals between the old light Puritans versus the new light Puritans. Um, so the new light Puritans, they de-emphasized ceremony and ritual, and they wanted a more spontaneous and emotional religious experience. Um, if you look at the picture to our, um, to our, I guess, right, we see um, this kind of more, you know, like spontaneous meeting, uh, sp spontaneous meeting where, you know, uh, we have the person standing, um, this person standing with his hands up in black. His name is actually George Whitfield um, giving sermons. Um, so when we do go to go on to this history course, our history course, we'll see the same kind of idea of, you know, people near the forest or near, very near to nature, um, connecting with sermons and just um, large masses. Um, so be, the first great awakening also led to an increased number of women in church congregations. And we spoke about before how women didn't really have that much social economic power. So this was a really good opportunity. And it's also sparked new missionary spirits to convert slaves um, through uh, Christianity. Um, and uh, the First Great Awakening also led to greater independence and diversity in thought to challenge political authority. And this would be important as we move closer to the American Revolution. And we also have another great event, the Enlightenment. Um, so if we see the picture right here, John Locke, he was actually a key figure um, uh, during in, uh, the Enlightenment in Europe. So basically what the Enlightenment was is these ideals that were um, from England, but they spread to North, the North American colonies or the English North American colonies through the trading, um, through the transatlantic trade. So many Enlightenment thinkers rejected superstition, bigotry, and tolerance. They stressed the human's ability to um, be educated and to understand um, nature and improve society. There was a big emphasis on reason and the um, idea that the government could improve society and the government should improve society. So John Locke, he's very known for his idea of natural rights. So the whole um, life, liberty, and happiness, seeming declaration of independence can be found um, within John, John Locke's writing. Right. Um, I saw the Google form. I saw the Google form, and I saw that um someone wanted to learn about the lost colony of Rome. I think. Can I, can I hear that is mute themselves? Sorry. Okay. Um. So the lost colony of Roanoke, um, so it actually is, it was, the colony of Roanoke was actually two attempts by Sir Walter uh, Rowling. I am not pretty sure how to pronounce the name, but the first colony was uh, established in 1585, but that failed. So he started a second colony um, led by, so there was a second colony led by John White. Um, 
to land on the same island in 1587, and that became the Lost Colony. So um, uh, John White's uh, colony, uh, alongside with uh, Walter Rain, um, was actually kind of troubled because they had a lack of supplies and they had poor relations with local Native Americans. So um, White and Lane decided to abandon the colony and return back to England to receive more supplies for the colony itself. But the Anglo-Spanish War actually delayed the return um, to Roanoke until 1590. And upon his arrival, the once colonists were actually all gone. And the only word, the word they found was proton or that word found cards alongside this kind of rock, um, this large kind of rock area. So the fate of around 112 to around 200 colonists remain unknown to this day. So many have wondered like what happened to these colonists, especially since this was right before the establishment of many of the 13 colonies. So many have said that they integrated with local tribes. Others said that, um, you know, they've tried to return to England by ship. Um, others have said that Native American uh, tribes attacked the colonies and that um, many of them died. Um, others have said that it was actually a Spanish attack of the colonies. So we're not really sure um, of what happened uh, with these colonists themselves, but it is something that's like, you know, sure, like a mystery. And then we see um, this picture, picture that was actually where Jamestown Colony was, and that's the lost colony of Roanoke. And that's um, the words. So um, during this time, as I mentioned before, um, at the end of class, I'll have one student or a couple students give a little summary of what we learned today. So for period one, I gave the little summary, which my with my four to five slides um, above. Does anyone want to volunteer to give a little summary, or maybe like one of the things they found really interesting today? Would anyone? Um, I'm seeing someone raise their hand. I can't. Um, Sophie. You have your hand raised. One of the things I found really interesting is like the word chrono was uh, carved into a tree. I don't know why they would carve that into a tree. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you, you could carve where you went into a yeah. tree and the, uh, the word wasn't really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is very true. Yeah. It, it remains a mystery, so I guess that's very interesting. Um, I saw another person. What, what I learned in class was that the word was the name of a Native American tribe. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so it's like um, many people have their conspiracies as to what happened to the colonies and we're still not sure. Um, here is, I guess, oh, so we can still go on with summaries. Does anyone else want to volunteer? Helena? Um, even though I already knew about the Salem witch trial, every time I learn about it, it's really mm -hmm. interesting to me. Yeah, um, I would totally recommend some books that y'all should read. Have y'all read The Crucible? Um, I would totally yeah. recommend reading it. It's actually really, really interesting. It gives, it's kind of this like play format, so um, it describes okay. events that happened. What, is, what's it again? What book is it again? Um, the Crucible, I can always type it in the Google Classroom, but I can recommend y'all books throughout, like the Salem Witch Trials, and I can recommend yeah. you know, TED Talk videos or like some movie documentaries that I find really interesting. Can you like type it in Google Classroom so yep. like we can all view it? Yep. Do you put the slides there? Yep, I can also put the slides on Google Classroom. Um, does anyone have anything you found interesting or like a summary of today's lesson? or any questions. I will also be taking questions as well. Um, a book that I read to learn about the Salem Witch Trials is the You Choose book about the Salem Witch Trials. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of paths you can read and you end up living or dying. 
It's this one. Wait, it, my video is on. Wait, it's this one, and it tells you a lot of information. Ow! Do you mind um sharing it over the Google Classroom post? Um. Okay. Later at after class, so your students can read it. Yep, that's really good. Thanks, Evelyn. Um. Does anyone else have any questions, summaries? If not, we can move on to like the last. I guess. I guess a activity. No, I don't have a question. You don't have a question? Okay, so we can move on. Um, if anyone else asks me questions, we can um send it to my email as well. Um. So lastly, I do this kind of thing. It's kind of this weekly. I guess I'll do this weekly meme thing where um, it's, it's going to be about what we learned today. So um, we have two here. Does anyone want to analyze or like uh, see, analyze one of these pictures to see um, what they mean or how they relate to our class today? You can choose any of the two. You can also raise your hand. Yes, Sophie. I think uh, the second one is like, uh, like relating to the witch trials, mm -hmm. and then the first one I think uh, it's a Puritan person because like they're really strict in what your religion is. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think the I think the first one is also how the how the like the 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 people from Europe wanted to convert the native mm -hmm. people to their to their religion. Yeah. And can you post the memes onto Google Classroom? I will post the memes on Google Classroom. Jonathan Wang. Um for the first one I think they just want everybody ha to have the same religion. Yeah. Yeah, you're totally right. Yeah. Um I think it works both ways for both Native Americans, also like Puritan society. Um, someone else, I saw someone else with their hands up. Oh, right here. Um, Helena? Um, I actually have a question. Yep. Um, could you like re-explain the, I think it was called like etude servitude or something? Oh, indentured servitude? Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, Evelyn actually described this um, before, but it was basically, you know, many people in New England who wanted to come to America didn't really have the money to come to America or come to these colonies. So they basically formed this kind of contract with, you know, wealthy landowners and basically said, if you take me to America, I will work for you for a set number of years. And after the number of years, I can continue working for you for money or I can just go off by myself and, you know, try to find my own job. That was, that was what indentured servitude was. And it wasn't really reliable because we talked about Bacon's Rebellion and how you know they burned Virginia, basically, in a rebellion. And they moved on to um, use of slavery for their economy. Yes, Sophie? Sophie? Okay. All right, she has her hand raised. Um, Jonathan, you have your hand raised? Or you unraised your hand. Helena, you still have your hand raised. Do you have another question? All right, um, lastly, am I pronouncing your name right? Is it Dana or Dana? Dana, Dana? Um, it's Dana. Dana, okay, yeah, you have your hand raised. You yeah, hand? so for the first one, I think they're trying to appear like they're not as strict, but mm -hmm. not, so most people only read captions to figure out the basic meaning of things, but they don't read the bottom, so that's kind of like fine print. Right, yeah, for sure. Um, does anyone have an interpretation of these two pictures or these two memes? I guess if not, I can like maybe do like a rhetorical question. Um, what would you, I guess, what would you, I guess, how would you like feel if you were, let's like all of a sudden like brought back to the time of like the Salem witch trials and you were um, kind of like convicted or you were accused of being a witch? Um, 
We have his name got more Tristan. No, it's because you don't let me change it. Oh. At the beginning of class, I asked you if you could let me change it, but you didn't. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see it. What's your name? Um, can you just change it to, uh... Yeah? Just change it to Alvin. Alvin? A-L-V-I-N. Yep. Okay. Dana, do you have a question or an answer? Um, I have an answer. Mm hmm So, no, actually I have a question. Yep. Back in those days, were you allowed to fight your trial? Fight your trial? I guess um for those who well we did talk about how you know like women didn't receive a lot of like um socioeconomic power during this time so finding your trial i guess maybe it was but you probably would have been accused like more accused of which you know you probably looked more guilty if you said you would fight your trial okay yeah alvin you have a question or an answer no i don't have a question just saying like in those times, if they accuse you of being a witch, I, I read some books about this because I like the topic. Mm -hmm. It's like sometimes they're like, they do like all types of weird stuff, like, oh, if you like, we drown them or bury them in a barrel or something. And if they like do this, if like they do this, they're a witch. If this doesn't happen, they're not a witch. But you, every time they're not a witch, right. but like they're dead already. Yeah. But also, like, if you are if you get accused of being a witch, then it's kind of like, if you admit to being a witch, you get put in prison for a long time, but, yeah. like, at least you'll survive. But if you say I'm not a witch, then you'll just get killed. Yeah, so it's obviously... The best to say that I'm a witch. You would say um, I'm a witch. Okay. Also, there's a different type of witch, which is, like, the dog in the time where it was... Um, I, well, I forgot what time it was, but the doctors, uh, well, there was some people that made potions, like, out of her, what they called potions, and the doctors told people not to get those because they think that those people are accused as witches and trying to poison the people that buy the, their, the uh, drinks that they make, and then they're... They put them in, to see if they're a witch or not. They put them in a sack and see if, if they drown, um, they're not a witch. But if they don't drown, that means they're a witch and they'll be burned alive. But either way, you die. Yeah, that is, yeah, very interesting. Um, I guess, um, also, Evelyn, I saw Evelyn in Google Classroom. She actually shared the book already. So, um, if, any of y'all are interested, you can look um, at the book. And there's another one called mm -hmm. Colonial America. It's about being an indentured servant. Indentured servant, yeah. yeah. Um, does anyone have any final questions before we end today's class? Could, could, could male people be witches? Yeah. Could male, no. yes, could. Does anyone want to answer? No. Yes. No, because they're men. It would be wizards. <laughs> they actually can. But then wizards would it's, be more magic than... than they're, they're not exactly witches. Okay, it's just witchcraft. Yeah, but um, there were men that were accused of being a witch as well. So. They were killed as well, too. But, yeah, I would definitely look into this. But it's... The joke is really funny. Um... So, any more questions? Or like any suggestions or to make this class more interesting? No? Okay. Um, so that's the end of the first class. Um, I hope you all learned something about Colonial America. Um, next topic, we'll be learning about the American Revolution and the start of the American Revolution. So um, I hope y'all are really interested in that topic. You have a lot to participate from. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Charge. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye